Well, I first came to Boston College in 1965, and my area was uh, foreign language pedagogy. I was in the Department of uh, Modern Languages at the time, which then became the Department of Romance Languages. And over the years, my husband and I developed uh, textbooks for the teaching of French and Spanish to high school students and college students. And the name Valette and Valette became connected with language textbooks. So now the question is, Valette and Valette have now written a book called Navajo Weavings with Cultural Themes. And where did this interest come from? Well, I think I have to go back to my childhood in Boulder, Colorado. My father was on the faculty of the university, and my parents had come uh, from Europe and they were decorating the house, and they put Navajo weavings on the floor. And I especially loved one weaving, a, a red weaving with geometric patterns that was in my father's study. And now that rug is in my study here in Chestnut Hill. I met my husband when I was spending my junior year in France, and when then I came back and graduated from college, and he graduated from business school, and we went to Colorado to do our PhDs, and that's when Jean-Paul got interested in Navajo weavings also. And so when we came to Boston College, we again had a home with no furniture and nothing on the floor. And we went to auctions and we would look for Navajo weavings. And most of these Navajo weavings, like the one in my study, are, are geometric. And at one auction, I believe it was in 1979, we found a weaving that had a person on it, a person with feathers, a dancer probably. I'd never seen a weaving like that, and, and we bought it. We, of course, didn't put it on the floor. We put it on the wall. You don't want to walk on people. Um, then 10 years later, we found a second weaving. This one was a much more delicate weaving, uh, primarily in red, with another figure on it. And again, we didn't quite know what that figure was, but we thought, this is getting very interesting. And so that really started our research in Navajo weavings with ceremonial themes. Well, as our interest in Navajo weavings increased, we were able to buy several weavings from a collection known as the Weber Collection, which had also weavings of groups of dancers in them. Uh, for example, uh, Here's a picture of one of those weavings, and you can see that there are men and women dancing in, the men are in kilts, and this aroused our interest even more. What was this dance? What was going on in these weavings? Well, our research went into high gear, and so did our collecting. And maybe we went crazy. Anyway, we would buy weavings that we could find that had these ceremonial images on them. And uh, by the year 2000, we, we had a rather substantial collection, and we did an exhibit at the Museum of Our National History in, in Lexington, Massachusetts. And we wrote our first book, which was a more or less a, uh, a catalog to go with that exhibit. Well, you saw the cover of it, uh, but the book itself is a rather big book. It, it weighs probably about six pounds, and it's uh, 450 pages long, and there are over 500 images and maps. and. It's really a research volume. It represents the work that we've done in, in researching these weavings over the past 30 years. It's important to note that these weavings have a ceremonial theme, but they were never used in, a, in any ceremonial function. Uh, the Navajo imagery used in their ceremonial functions is in the form of sand paintings. These sand paintings are created during the day uh, the patient comes and sits on the sand painting. The power of the sand painting is given to the patient, and then the sand painting is erased. The sands are taken outside and buried. And so the Navajos had a taboo against uh, permanent reproductions of their sand paintings. Well, now a weaving is a permanent reproduction, so that weavers would not actually create sand paintings in the weavings, but took some of the imagery of their ceremonies and wove that into the weavings. The weavers were encouraged by the traders on the reservation to put ceremonial imagery into their weavings because the traders knew that they had clients in 
New England, in Philadelphia, in Chicago, in California, who are willing to pay much higher prices for weavings that they perceived as having some sort of spiritual meaning. The Navajo women, on the other hand, were hesitant to create these types of weavings. Uh, but gradually some women, especially those who lived off the reservation or at the edges of the reservation where uh, they were a bit freer, began weaving such rugs or actually textiles, tapestries, with ceremonial imagery. And this began around 1900. In our book, we trace these weavings from uh, their origins around 1900 through their development in the 1920s, where there was a great deal of originality. And if, if you recall your history, this was a time when things were booming in the United States. And so there were many collectors who were willing to pay good prices for these weavings. Uh, the art declined a little bit in the 30s with the Depression. And then with World War II, many of the weavers went and worked in the, in the plants in, uh, for munitions, et, et cetera, in California and other big cities, and there was less weaving going on. There were also less people interested in purchasing weavings. And now in the 1960s, 1980s, even now in the year 2000, there are still some of these weavings being made. So in our book, we trace the evolution from 1900 up to the present time. Well, as I said in the beginning, we knew very little about the topic. So we began by reading books, developing a library, uh, visiting museums, uh, t attending shows, attending antique uh, Indian shows, talking to experts. And it, it's been a long, an ongoing process because at the same time I was, of course, teaching here full time. So this was more of a, a hobby, a, a hobby that both of us were interested in, in following. I also created a, a database. I contacted all the museums in the United States that I knew had, that perhaps had collections of Navajo weavings to ask if they had any weavings with ceremonial imagery in their collection. Now, all along, over the past century or more, the Navajo weavers have mainly done weavings with geometric imagery for, for blankets and then later for rugs. And the museums were collecting these older weavings, these older blankets, and, and thought that some of these uh, newer ceremonial themes were just tourist kitsch. So they weren't really collected. And the experts in the 1930s had totally written them off as being not worthy of interest. And so most of the museums had very few of these weavings. We would find for example, Harvard Peabody has two. The University of Colorado, which has a collection of six or 700 Navajo weavings, has about three with ceremonial imagery. Uh, similarly, in, in uh, Colorado Springs, a Taylor Museum with its 600 Navajo weavings has about four or five. And, and so I was able to make a, get a database of weavings with the pictures in, in various museums. The next step was, of course, viewing the weavings. Uh, and here I had an advantage. I could say I was at Boston College, a professor, PhD, University of Colorado, known, of course, for its anthropology studies, and would get permission to go to the museum and, and go into the vaults, and they would pull out the three or four weavings they had so that I could examine them. Uh, and sometimes my husband came along. I actually also ar arranged some of my speaking engagements because I was lecturing on uh, French teaching methods and language teaching methods so that I would accept uh, invitations to speak in areas where I wanted to see a particular museum. <laughs> and that worked out pretty well. Um, so by the 1990s, we knew more about what was going on and we also ha had more information. We had a library and, and we had a fairly strong database. I should also add that the Navajo weavers uh, were anonymous. These early weavers d didn't sign their weavings. It's hard to sign a weaving in any case. Some of them now sign with little feathers in the corner or something. But the weavings were unsigned. The records didn't indicate who had pr brought the weaving into the trader. And so and there were actually very few uh, documents as to actually when a weaving was collected. So there was a lot of um, wrong information out there. The, the books had errors. The catalogs of the museums were not always accurate, um, simply because people didn't know much about the topic. 
And so much of our research has been trying to straighten out the records to find out exactly when weavings were woven of a certain style, uh, if possible, even identifying the weavers. That was, that was trickier. A great deal of help was provided by uh, the uh, office here at Boston College of the interli interlibrary loan librarians who were very helpful in helping us track down old photographs, old manuscripts, little articles in magazines or newspapers. Uh, they were just fantastic. They even found a, a manuscript, a missing manuscript uh, that we were able to study, which helped us in our research. So thank you to Interlibrary Loan. Well, for example, in, in 1996, we were visiting the museum, the American Museum of Natural History in New York City, because they had one such weaving. It's a weaving with corn people on it. What was very interesting about this weaving was that there was an actual letter in the catalog uh, collection which indicated that it had been purchased in 1911 from a Mr. Hollister, who had also wrote, written a book on weavings, and who lived in Denver. And he indicated that these were corn gods, that the weaving had been done in the San Juan Agency, which is the little piece of the reservation at the four corners in the southeastern corner of Utah to the north of the San Juan River and that it had been woven for a Mrs. Peabody of Washington, D.C. Well, that, that was very interesting information. But who was Mrs. Peabody? I mean, there's a Peabody Museum at, at Harvard. There's a Peabody Museum in Yale. The Peabody's are known in New England. But there was no record of any Mrs. Peabody who went out to the Navajo Reservation around 1900. Every time we met an expert, uh, or, or a trader or a collector, we would ask, have you heard of a Mrs. Peabody? Nobody had. Then we finally thought we had our breakthrough. We learned about a Mrs. Peabody who had been active in Denver in promoting the Mesa Verde National Park, turning that area into a national park. And she was known as the mother of Mesa Verde. Now in this little tag that we had seen at the museum, it said Mrs. Peabody was uh, the white mother of the Navajos. Didn't mention Mesa Verde, but mother, Peabody, it sounded right. She was in the right area. And I actually wrote an article uh, three or four years ago where I mentioned that the Mrs. Peabody was Mrs. Lucy Peabody. And just a year or so before our book was go really going into print, we discovered that there was a Mrs. Harriet Peabody. We had been looking at the archives of the photographs of the Denver Public Library, and we had found a photograph identified as Mrs. Harriet Peabody, taken in Bluff, Utah, which is the San Juan Agency, with weavers. We then did more and more research on who was this Mrs. Harriet Peabody. It turns out that she was from New England. Peabody's were from New England. She had lived in uh, Boston in the late uh, 1880s, early 1890s. One day she had seen a, a crippled boy, an orphan in the street, and wondered what could be done to help crippled children who'd sort of been left by their parents to survive. And she founded the Peabody Home for Crippled Children in, in Boston. And, but a few years later, she, she moved on to Washington. This Peabody Home for Crippled Children actually then moved to Newton, Massachusetts, where it functioned until 1960. She continued with her philanthropic interests and had visited the Navajo Reservation in the San Juan area. She realized the women there were weaving rather uninteresting weavings and were really quite poor. In the Navajo uh, society, the money comes from making, selling wool or weaving carpets at that point, weaving rugs and selling them to the traders. She thought if she could improve their weaving style, they would get better prices for their weavings. And then she would take these better weavings back to Denver and to Washington, D.C., and, and sell them to her friends at, at, much, at much, much higher prices. She did this for many, many years. She then decided in 1900 to begin a fair in Bluff, where the, inviting the Navajos and giving prizes for you know, the best squash, the healthiest horses, and also for the finest weavings. And the weavers were astonished. They said, we're getting a, a prize and you're not buying the weaving, you're 
letting us keep the weaving and sell it perhaps and have a prize. Uh, but they soon learned that these annual fairs were a place where they could really show off their skills. The first prize was a sewing machine, a treadle sewing machine, obviously not electric, because the Navajo women sewed all their clothing too. So this is an example of a weaving that we discovered in 1996, and we really didn't learn about who had promoted this weaving until almost 20 years later. So in fall 2012, we began exploring the possibility of perhaps having an exhibit of some of our better weavings of the Yebiche dance. And I contacted Mount Holyoke College because I am a graduate of Mount Holyoke College, and their museum was very interested in sponsoring such an exhibit. Of course, exhibits are prepared three and four years in advance, so we had plenty of time to begin thinking about which weavings to show and, and how to uh, find a theme for the exhibit. Uh, it was decided we'd call it Dancers of the Nightway. And, and so I, I also then contacted a, a publishing house. I contacted Schiffer Books to see if they wouldn't be interested in bringing out a book of our research, which then would be promoted in conjunction with this exhibit at Mount Holyoke College. And we were fortunate in that Nancy Schiffer, who was the founder of the Schiffer Publishing, had herself been interested in Navajo weavings and had written one of the first books on pictorial Navajo weavings. So they were very interested in the book. The book, though, became a major project because the Schiffer Publishing House expects the authors not only to uh, deliver the manuscript according to a certain format, but also to deliver high-resolution uh, files for all the images and to obtain the permissions for all the images. Now, we have 120 different sources of images, individuals, museums, libraries, etc. And so this writing the book, you know, the 450 pages, that was one challenge. The next challenge was getting all the permissions and submitting the manuscript. And there we spent a great deal of time and also a certain amount of money because some of the museums required fees for the photographs. Some of them required permissions for publishing. Some required both. Some generously waived both of these. Uh, and fortunately, Boston College Association of Retired Professors, BCARF, gave me a grant to help subsidize some of these permissions. Another little stumbling block was that my husband had to have open heart surgery, and that slowed us down. So what happened was that the ex exhibit at Mount Holyoke uh, took place in 2016, but the book was not yet published. We actually published the book then a year later, and it, it appeared in summer of 2017, and we were able to present it at the Antique Indian Shows in Santa Fe in, in August, and it was very, very well received. Nobody had put together this much research on this topic, and the, the reception was, was just fantastic. We're sometimes asked the question, if you had known how long the process was to bring this book out and how expensive and, and the frustrations you would meet, uh, would you still have gone on with the project? And the answer to this is yes. We'd done all this research and what good does it do sitting on my computer? Now it's out there for people to read and enjoy.